Welcome to the Truth in This Art. I am your host, Rob Lee, and I am privileged to be in conversation today with an artist as well as an advisor to cities in their efforts to support local arts and cultural communities by offering guidance in equitable grant making, public art investments, data collection and evaluation, as well as nonprofit governance. Please welcome David Anderson. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for having me, Rob. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a, it's a pleasure to have you on. I'm glad we were able to chat a few moments uh, before we got started. And um, so I got some nerdy data questions and uh, yeah, <laughs> we'll, we'll see. We'll see what we get. Um, so, you know, again, thank you for popping on and, and making the time because uh, we're, we're all uh, it's a valuable asset these days, I'll say. So for, for you, could you um, really describe what your work is like? I usually ask it like describe what you do in a, in a poor way, like. If someone asks, what do I do? I was like, I talk to people more talented than me. So what, <laughs> d- d- describe what, what you do for the, for the listeners. Sure. So uh, my, the core of my work is all art and cities. I, I advise city governments on how to better support arts and culture in their local communities. So some cities do it really well. Some cities are just getting on the bandwagon, seeing seeing the real value and an impact that arts can have in their, their local communities. And so I'm here to try to help them move those efforts forward. Thank you. So, so what, what is it about sorts of like, you know, arts advocacy and, um, and being an advisor in that sort of space and being able to back it up with like this, this, this ba- ba- uh, foundation and data and this knowledge and data. What is about that that resonates you? And um, I have one other question with this sort of part of it. But what is it about your work that resonated with you and kind of like pulled you in? Sure. I mean, arts advocacy is is, it's a funny term because, um, you know, do you really need to advocate for more art? Um, <laughs> but, you know, at the end of the day, I mean, I I totally believe that art is a core manifestation of our humanity and the more art is better. And, and you know, art will always find a way. But there are real impacts art can have on individuals, on communities that are tangible, that are measurable. And it makes arts and culture more than just a nice to have thing for sure. cities. And so for me, arts advocacy is most valuable when it is making the case for why it's important for those with decision making power to actually embrace the arts and its many values and impacts and, and bring artists to the table when they're making decisions. So, you know, most of my work is through Bloomberg Associates, which is the pro bono municipal consulting arm of Bloomberg Philanthropies, which is Mike Bloomberg's charitable foundation. And what I do on the consulting side is really work with city governments, often their arts agencies when they have one, or if not, then maybe their economic development department or their parks department, wherever arts and culture is housed. And improving their services in terms of the arts so services for artists for their creative communities and broadening the reach of arts and culture across all citizens in their cities and so there's there's this this advocacy within government there is advocacy across a city to show that art is not just a painting on a wall it can also be you know, uh, a a dance party on a street. It could be a, a pottery class that you take in your local church. And all of this is really valuable and meaningful and beneficial in a city. Yeah, um, even uh, even maybe a, a humble podcast uh, here and there. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I really like admire that that sort of work and that, you know, just awareness of it. Like, I think at times we have these like, in times almost rigid or hollow kind of ideas of art is this, but it's not that. And it's almost exclusionary. So having someone that's doing that sort of work and working with the parties that be is like, maybe this is how you should look at it. And these are some of the benefits. Um, Could you tell us about like how data plays a role in your work? Sure. So um, I used to work for the New York city government for their department of cultural affairs. And I helped run the primary grant program for artists and arts organizations. And I kind of 
became the de facto data guy. Not because I'm really <laughs> trained, I'm not a data scientist, but I was decent with an Excel spreadsheet and I, I was the person who ended up taking up the mantle. And what I found was that, um, you know, there's a lot of data that's coming in from artists and from arts organizations to local governments, particularly those that provide grants or services to them. And the data usually isn't used for all that much beyond compliance purposes, just making sure that public taxpayer dollars are being used appropriately. And there is this pervasive sense that the arts and data are like oil and water. They just yes. don't mix. You, you can't describe an arts experience in numbers. You know, what, what is the point of making a chart or a graph to trying to show the impact of the arts? But there are ways that you can measure things. And there there is data that comes along with arts activity. Yeah. Sometimes that's kind of um, qualitative data, but sometimes it's quantitative. Where are arts or city funded arts activities taking place? Where are they not taking place? Who is participating in the art making? Who's not participating? Who is consuming the art? Who are the sure. audiences and who aren't the audiences? And when you think about arts and culture and its impact as a public benefit, that's when at the local government level, data really can come in to make sure that you're providing access to the arts across all communities because it's really, a valuable part of living in a city and it's something that nobody should miss out on and so there there is a, a role for data in the arts even if it's not entirely clear and i've i've started to see the light and try to try to get others on board too yeah i i, I think of like you know data-driven storytelling like you can creatively do it in a presentation and still have these 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 points. And I think the the oil and water analogy works very well because uh I, you know, having that background in data, I'm the the de facto data guy in my my day job, as I was saying. And <laughs> You know, I think you could have described what you did earlier. I know how to use a spread, I know my way around a spreadsheet, you know, Google <laughs> Sheets, maybe. Uh and and, and I, I just recall like looking at um, putting together proposals and pitches of, you know, what is the impact? And, you know, what I do is hard to really put in because it's like, it's about people. It's not about, I had this many downloads or I've reached this many people, you know, all of that can be fudged. And that's just knowing that that sort of data background, but in terms of impact, I'm like, you know, my impact is aligned to, or the impact of the work that I'm doing is aligned to this industry. This industry has this much tourism and so on. So, you know, or this much work or this much of a um, economic impact, what I'm doing is exposing folks to that that may not know about it otherwise. And I found that people locally like, oh, I didn't know this person was doing this sort of work or people even in the region I'm like, wow, that happened in Baltimore. So, you know, I think having more of the business conversation, because we, we like to kind of separate those two things. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, economic impact is a huge part of it. And I think that's a way in for a lot of city leaders because you can, you know, money speaks all languages. Like that, that's an easy in. You say, okay, well, we do more art. That's going to bring in more tourists. That's amazing. But that also ends up privileging certain kinds of arts and culture, arts yeah. and culture that will reach tourists that maybe is more popular. And, you know, you're not looking for artists aren't looking for how many Instagram likes they are to decide what their next project is going to be. I mean, maybe some are, but <laughs> the the creative process isn't all about just what's going to be popular. It's about what's actually really inspirational and new and, 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 and risk risky. So some, there has been some research that's really diving into the social impacts sure. of arts and culture. And that I find even more interesting in some ways than the economic impacts. There is a study that I was a part of back in New York City. Uh, it started in 2014 and it was run out of University of Pennsylvania. It's called the Social Impact of the Arts Project. Sure. And the professors there studied New York City, looked at a bunch of lower income neighborhoods, some that had a lot of artists and a lot of arts organizations based there and some that didn't. And then they compared them along a whole host of social well-being indicators. And they found that 
the neighborhoods that had similar profiles otherwise, the neighborhoods that had more arts activity going on also fared better when it came to crime rates, when it came to graduation rates, when it came to obesity rates. It was really, really interesting to see across all these different indicators yeah. how it seemed that there was a correlation between more arts activity and just a, a better quality of life for residents in, in neighborhoods. And that's the type of information that I, it's hard to come by, but when you can find it, that really shows the the breadth of value that arts can bring to to regular ordinary people. So, it, and in some ways, it contributes to the culture, the vibrancy, and identities of cities. Like, you know, when I go to a place, you know, I, it's, it's a few things that I look for when I go to a new place. Like, oh, where's the coffee and the street art? You know, that's that's what I'm looking for, and. I think that's an identity marker. And I think when I go to a place and I see like a nice mural or even um, I know that they do like these different this, the the I think traffic kind of abatement or funneling sort of work. And it's um, painted like uh, streets. And I see that sort of work. And it's like, I like that. And it makes me feel like there's an investment in people care about this community. And I think anecdotally, maybe that's what that's attaching to. Absolutely. Yeah. And public art is such a great manifestation of that. It's very visible and it's accessible to everyone. Yeah. So whether you're visiting a city and you're seeing all the great murals that are around a neighborhood and it makes you think a different way about where you are or you're a resident or you're, you know, of that neighborhood, you're passing through it on a bus and you're you're looking out the window and and seeing this great art that is meant for you, that can that can be a really wonderful manifestation of exactly what you were talking about, the care and attention that um, the city and and the residents are, are giving to their public spaces. I mean, I, I think that there's there's a lot when you're trying to to figure out what what is what is this? What does it mean to be a city with a, a great art scene? <laughs> right. Um, and so public art is a huge part of it is very visible. But I also think that it's the number of artists, the opportunities for artists, the spaces where artists can work, um, and the institutions that are there to provide uh, platforms for artists to show their work. So that's both the big flagship anchor institutions and the teeny tiny fledgling startup institutions and something in between, you know, so that there are, are gradations where where the the homegrown organizations that really build capacity and then can become those anchor institutions one day. You need this whole vibrant, I hate this word, but it, we use it all the time in, in the field, ecosystem yeah. of, of arts and culture and different kinds of organizations and different kinds of disciplines all working together in order to have a, a thriving cultural city. Thank you. Thank you for that. So tell us about, you know, the listeners and my, myself, because I'm, I'm learning as much as anyone else is at this point. Uh, tell us about some of the like low cost but high impact like art interventions in public safety, like like um, asphalt art. Like what is the thinking behind like projects like this? Sure. So the Asphalt Art Initiative is a program of Bloomberg Philanthropies. Uh, it, it came out of the work of Bloomberg Associates, the consulting wing that that I am a part of. I'm on the arts and culture team there, but we also have a transportation team. And so our teams came together and we formed this program because um, we've seen in cities around the world that you can use art to make streets safer for pedestrians, for bikers, for all the people who are using using the roads and neighborhoods, not just the, the drivers and the cars that are driving through them. And this really started back when Mike Bloomberg was mayor of New York. Uh, his transportation commissioner, Jeanette Sadek Khan, uh, led a number of these asphalt art projects in New York. And the most, the 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 flagship one was in Times Square, True. where she and her agency shut down a section of Broadway right in the heart of Manhattan, and commissioned an artist to paint a mural along a couple block length of it, and it kept it open only for pedestrians, so cars couldn't drive through it. And then they measured the impacts and they saw a ton of people were coming out and sitting there, hanging out there. But they also saw that there was a dramatic reduction in crashes, car crashes that involved the pedestrians oh, wow. who were walking through this previously very chaotic intersection. It was like the heart of the universe that everybody was coming there and there were there was no space. 
And so with that data in hand, the city then permanently pedestrianized Times Square. They poured concrete, made this huge pedestrian plaza that now is like a, a wonderful welcome pad for tourists coming to New York City. So most of the asphalt art projects that we see are much smaller scale than that. But we've seen time and time again now that these projects can be relatively low cost yeah. temporary projects that have outsized impacts. Um, there was one actually in Baltimore, Ooh. which we were talking about <laughs> yeah, a little earlier, that is one of my favorite of our projects. It's in the Johnston Square neighborhood and it's near Johnston Square Elementary School. And there are these two streets on either side of the elementary school that are pretty wide and they're frequently used by drivers to get in and out of downtown. And so a lot of drivers would speed through the, the intersections near the school. And actually in a speed study, they clocked speeds as high as 85 miles per hour in a school zone. And that was in the middle wow. of the school day. And so they, the, the community knew that this, these were streets were dangerous and they wanted to do something creative and innovative. And the city's Department of Transportation has this great creative placemaking program. And so they came together with the residents of Johnson Square and their community organization and some designers uh, from the Maryland Institute College of Art and their Made You Look in initiative. And they all applied for our program. They got a grant and they ended up installing these murals that are in sidewalk extensions. They're like curb bump outs yeah. uh, in these streets. It's very, it's technical, but what it does is it shortens the crosswalk, which means it's faster for pedestrians to get across the street. It also makes it forces cars to drive out into the intersection and take deliberate turns instead of cutting the corners, and which is very dangerous uh, for pedestrians crossing. And as you said earlier, it just gives a sense of somebody cares about this neighborhood. And so it seems that drivers are, are slowing down and they're, they're letting pedestrians cross more often than they were before. And they, they did a study and they found that before um or after they they put in these artistic curb bump outs drivers were 41 percent more likely to yield to pedestrians who had the right of way than previously and, and that's huge like that's that's in numbers showing that this art is making these streets safer and this is for you know your school kids your the the folks in your neighborhood yeah. what could be better than that yeah, and as I was fumbling through that, my explanation of that artistic uh, curb bump out, if you will, that's actually <laughs> I actually have one in my neighborhood. I'm in the the Collington East Baltimore area, so not far from that Chase Street. Yeah, I I, oh, I remember fantastic. I remember when they were working on it, and I was like, this is artistic, and kind of seeing like people are not blowing through. I know. Early on, uh, I know a few people are like, what is this? This is a complaint, you know, people not adjusting to new things. But I was like, yep. as a resident, this is actually a public safety thing. And I like it. It's, you know, streamlined is straight for the drivers. And, you know, they're more, they're not just like turning aimlessly and riding up on the curb and just people don't care. But when you see that then you see work happening, it's like, oh, okay, I need to pay attention to this. And right over there, my... This is really funny, but my old elementary school is behind it and there's a huge mural like on that wall. And I was like, this has been abandoned for years, but I at least see something being done there. You know, people taking the time of like a two week project and painting this mural. I'm like, OK, there is a tension in this area and I'm waiting for my coffee shop, you know, <laughs> signs of a healthy neighborhood, <laughs> coffee shops and art. Exactly. But I also think it's a nice opportunity for people in a neighborhood to come out and actually shape the way their neighborhood looks. Yeah. And so a lot of public art projects, I mean, some public art projects are, they're very technical. If you're, you're building something that requires professionals, you can't really have community members participate in the creation of it. But most of our asphalt art projects are just paint on pavement. And so it's a perfect opportunity for artists to invite residents to come out and help paint, pick up a paintbrush and actually, you know, maybe it's a little paint by numbers, but, you know, you go over here and paint this pink flower and you go over here and paint this blue square. Yeah. And it's such a cool way for people to 
actually make their neighborhoods more beautiful and more inviting and safer. And then every day they'll walk by that street corner and they'll say, hey, I made that. It's 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 a it's a special thing and it doesn't cost that much. And it 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 is something that I think more cities should be paying attention to. And it uh, it it's just starting to catch more attention. Yeah, I believe it was like cram projects or something. Yeah, that's yeah, what, uh, exactly. Yeah, I've I've seen. I remember seeing them out there and definitely seeing like people in the community, the kids in the community. Like, yeah, I'm gonna paint paint this uh, green triangle. I was like, okay, yeah, get at it, get at it. Learn how to use these brushes. This is great. <laughs> and you know, maybe some you know some some new artists were born out of that experience. Um, and you know, even this other standpoint of beautifying a place. You know, like you see art going, you see people doing stuff, especially your neighbors, you're less inclined to throw that Dunkin' Donut wrapper on the ground. You might look for a, a trash can or something because, you know, that's that's a thing. Like I know in walking through different neighborhoods, I'm a walker, I'm an observer that way. Um, if I see, you know, trash there, I get the, the tear, you know, I get that. And <laughs> seeing that, you know, people are out in the community and having fellowship, that's 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 big. It's big for me. Totally. So I read that you're also an artist. So let's let's talk about that a little bit. Uh, you've been creative since you were young, practicing theater, um, practicing in theater, uh, painting, and uh, believe it's like a textile sort of like puppets or what have you. So tell me about like a life experience that shaped your creative sensibilities. Mm, a life experience. Um, well, I guess what comes to mind. So I went to Montessori school uh, from preschool to uh, when I was in sixth grade, and I remember when I was probably about five or six years old, they taught us how to sew, which seems a little young. <laughs> Here's these needles. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think we probably used plastic needles. I have no idea and felt, but I remember we sewed bean bags and I didn't think much of it because we were learning all sorts of things like that. We learned how to sure. iron, we learned how to cut carrots with those little squiggly knives, you know, that the kind of safety knives. And, but then being able to sew was just, something I could do growing up. And I remember we'd like for the school plays, I had to sew pieces of my costumes and all this stuff. So, I, you know, then I, I grew up and I, I didn't really sew very much, but um, as an adult, I started, when I was broadening my artistic practice, um, I started sewing these little creatures and I just felt so lucky that I had this ability or just familiarity with, with textiles, with, with the act of sewing that I felt confident enough to try things out. Um, and so that was, I guess, an experience that, that I felt, I felt lucky to have had yeah. uh, because it, it opened the door for me. Yeah. I mean, ha having those experiences and the uh, being fortunate, having the uh, curiosity and the courage to create is, is definitely a thing. Um, Sometimes when I'm doing this, which I struggle, whether it's creativity or not, that I'm like, all right, is this going to come out? Well, these questions meaningful. Does it make sense? And it really juggling and struggling with that until the actual conversation is going, because I don't look at these as interviews. I look at them as conversations. And on occasion, I will talk to other artists that will really just stop me and say, no, you're doing it. Or, you know, were you ever in front of people when you were a kid and really tapping back into that young creativity? And I remember talking to a theater person and they were like, oh, they were playwright and, um, and choreographer. And they were like, let me guess, you were like a master's of ceremony when you were really young, weren't you? And I was like, <laughs> yes, I was. I was at like five. And being able to tap back into that because it's something about you know, some of that early experience that uh, that kind of childhood or, or young experience that you never really forget, you never really lose. You may do it in a different way, but that spirit and that energy is always there. Absolutely. And I think some of it is also just allowing yourself the opportunity to do it because you you've done it before, even even if you were five uh, <laughs> and, you know, who knows what it was like, you feel, oh, you know, this is something I can do or I kind of have a way in. Yeah. Um, and you're right. It's, it's totally creative. I mean, this is like, it's, it's improv, it's storytelling. It's, uh, it's incredible. Well, thank you. I said, so this is the last real question I have, and I have a few rapid fire questions if you'll indulge me. So, you know, also you're a traveler and I, I love talking to people who travel, um, cause it's, it's different perspectives, right? Uh, 
So in what ways do does travel like um, impact you as a creative and how you see like the world? How does it inspire you creatively? Hmm. Yeah, so I, I do like traveling a lot. Uh, I've been fortunate to uh, go a bunch of different places, both, you know, personally with my husband and also for my job um, as part of the, the work that we do with many different cities. I would say there are, you know, at the core of it, just being in different places and seeing different ways that people engage with their cities is 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 so valuable just yeah. to you know I, I grew up in new york city i spend most of my time in new york city and so it's easy to see it as one way of life and just expect that every city is like this but actually getting to spend time and meet people and seeing the art that's being produced or not being produced in a particular place is just so enlightening um I was in Tel Aviv actually a few days ago. Uh, this I, I had some work travel and I, I tacked on uh, a trip with my husband to Tel Aviv for fun, and we got to see a few great exhibits. There's a lot going on in the AI artificial intelligence art world, uh, yeah. which is very fascinating. But we also got to do a studio visit with um, a friend of a friend who is uh, a her name is Orit Hafshi. She's a, a world-renowned printmaker. And her studio is out of the city. It's in a Moshav, um, sort of in a, in a rural area. And it was just so wonderful to get to sit with her, sit in this space where she was creating these gigantic prints and these gigantic wood etchings and just feel her process step by step that, you know, I don't know. It, it just felt very of that particular place. It felt very outside my comfort zone and my awareness. And I don't know, it just, it, it broadens the way I, I think about people and the way I think about cities. And that affects me very much in my day-to-day -day work, but also in my artistic practice. You know, a lot of what I do is I create these creatures, but I also paint people. Yeah. And so getting to connect with other artists, artists who are creating their own imagery of people who have their own way of creating form and, and aesthetics is, is very influential in, in my own artistic practice too. Well, thank you. Thank you for, for sharing that. that was, it's very, very interesting. And um, I feel it's regenerative to travel. Like I'm getting like just new feelings, new vibes. And, you know, one of the things that I'm doing outside of the series is a, a spinoff series called The Truth in This Art Beyond, where I visit other cities. And I think it's important to do the interviews in the, the cities that I'm doing the interviews with. Like, I'm going to talk to seven people in Philadelphia. I should probably do it in Philadelphia because I think it's it leads to a richer conversation. It's an away game for me, but a home game for them. And just things that you're not even looking for come out of the conversation. And there is an opportunity for the recommendation of, hey, we should go get food here. There's an interesting story about this place. It's it's something richer. It's actually fellowship and community. And it's bringing Baltimore and what my lived experience is as a creative here to those cities and exchanging in that way. And I just think it's really cool. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, and place is so important in art and just in life. And yeah. so, you know, having a conversation in the space where you're talking about, you know, where you are, I think that that sounds super cool. I'm excited to listen. 100%. Uh, so if you'll indulge me, I got four rapid fire questions for you. They're super brief, um, but they are ridiculous. I'm just letting you know, they may <laughs> not have anything to do with your work, uh, but they're, they're interesting at least. Uh, this is the most controversial one. Um, Crunchy or creamy peanut butter? Which which one are you do you prefer? Creamy peanut butter all the way. I'm not not a crunchy peanut butter guy. And I love peanut butter. You ask my husband. I always am like <laughs> skippy creamy every single time. <laughs> okay. I'm here for it. I'm here for it. What is your current phone background? Oh, my current phone background. Um it, it is a picture of a tea towel, a Swedish tea towel at my aunt's house. Um, so my my father was Swedish. And so my aunt is also Swedish. And it has little mushroom people on it. Nice. Yeah, I, it's always interesting to get an idea of what people have on their thing. Like some people have their dog, some people have a cat. And it's like, yeah, I had this time that I was in uh, this different country. It's like, oh, okay. You know, it's, it's, it's just interesting to me. <laughs> what is your favorite color? I would say orange. Um, I, well, I don't know. So 
growing up, it was always orange. I have been gravitating a little more toward like a goldenrod yellow, almost like an or orangey yellow, yeah. which comes out in a lot of my paintings. And uh, this is the last one I got for you. Uh, and uh, I know you're busy, you're, you're globe trotting, you know. Uh, so what is the last movie that you've seen? The last movie that I've seen. Um, trying to remember. Oh, I just watched on the plane everything everywhere all at once it was fantastic that's great that's great it's on my list i i we have a, a video store here that i i work with and i do movie screenings with it's like i didn't have a chance to watch it because i'm so busy now i need to just rent it again that's a that's an endorsement the the energy that came off you when you described it's like no it's great it's fantastic <laughs> yeah i mean it's funny it's tear jerking it, it's everything it's great yeah, all the time, everywhere. Uh, <laughs> so, so, so with that, I want to thank you again for coming on to this podcast, and um, I want to invite and encourage you to share with the listeners where they can check you out, check out your work, and uh, more about Bloomberg. So, tell me, tell me, tell me the floor is yours. <laughs> Sure. So to learn more about the Asphalt Art Initiative, you can go to asphaltart.bloomberg.org. And uh, to learn more about my artwork, my website is D as in David Anderson. It's Anderson with two S's. So A-N-D-E-R-S-S-O-N.com. Well, there you have it, folks. Again, for David Anderson, I am Rob Lee saying that there are ways to support the local arts and cultural communities in your neck of the woods. You just got to look for it.